Great. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, Delegate Assembly for today, uh, June 9th, uh, the usual time. Uh, the uh, I'm both the host and the presenter today because of the fact that uh, uh, Melissa, who normally would be hosting those, is uh, in a process of uh, striking at the University of Washington. You probably know about that. You've seen it in uh, some of the email messages from her. Apparently, there's a, a strike of the uh, uh, of the academic workers there for uh, especially I think that the, the main goal is for both uh, increase in salary but also for uh, accommodation of uh, of child care and so on and so forth anyway um so I'm going to be presenting today uh two science platform portal tutorials again this is the portal aspect rather than notebook aspect of the Ruben science platform which is something that many of you are familiar with um, portal, just to give you a, a bit of a sense of what's going on, portal is a good, easy way to get into Ruben analysis, simply because of the fact that you don't need to know um, how to run notebooks. It basically is a very nice um, user-facing uh, um, type, uh, type web-based uh, system, which allows you to um, explore the data and so on and so forth. So today we're going to cover two tutorials. Um, number four um, in our list of uh, portal tutorials will be um, aimed at exploring object populations uh, with histograms. The second one, uh, number five, will be a bit shorter and a simpler one, which will use a fairly funny uh, trick. You will see it's very clever when we're going to be plotting multiband light curves of a supernova using so-called forced photometry. But key thing is that not only there will be multiband light curves, but we also will be able to mark the uh, bands for observing bands with different colors. And again, I am uh, Greg Medeski uh, from the community um, science team at, uh, uh, at Rubin, but I'm also at Slack. So let me give you a little bit of a short bio. Uh, many of you probably have seen the bio that uh, uh, Ryan presented in one of his uh, assemblies uh, some time ago. Um, so I was born in Warsaw in Poland, uh, went to college in Cambridge in Massachusetts, um, and I'm currently a staff scientist at Slack, but I also have an academic appointment uh, as an adjunct professor at Stanford Physics. I teach a, a course a year there and also uh, had some graduate students there. And I'm very much a member of the uh, Rubin Community Science Team, but I also wear another hat. I am a member of uh, in-kind contributions team, which basically uh, assesses and uh, manages the international contributions to the Rubin um, observatory system. As you probably know, Rubin is essentially open and free for any US or Chilean uh, uh, scientific community member, but not so necessarily for other countries. Uh, people from those countries have to contribute either software or maybe some kind of uh, uh, collaboration in form of uh, uh, working on hardware and so on and so forth. But that's a different story. Um, so there's a number of people who already are uh, participating in the uh, uh, in the assemblies who are from other countries. I already see uh, certainly Vincenzo is here and then certainly others. Uh, my research interests are uh, in primarily originally from high energy astrophysics and currently I'm working on the X-ray polarimetry. You can see the uh, little image of the satellite that is in orbit already, it has been in orbit for about a year and a half or so. It's known as the International or Imaging X-ray Polarimeter Experiment, and we're collecting data from that. Um, and in the future, we are hoping that uh, we will enter the time domain uh, analysis of, uh, of sources which actually have uh, X-ray polarimeter observed in them, and maybe there will be a, a good collaboration with, uh, with Rubin uh, in terms of correlating optical flux variations with change of the angle of the X-ray polarimetry. But that's a different story. That's not for today. Uh, I'm interested in all aspects of active galaxies. In particular, what I'm really interested in is what is the connection between the accreting material and the, the accretion of uh, onto a, a compact central black hole and a formation of relativistic jet. Uh, I'm also interested in cosmology with strong lenses, especially cosmography, having to do with the delays of the light curves of two different images um, that would be presumably discovered by Rubin. But I think that overarching interest for me is really the connecting the broad range of multi-messenger astrophysics um, to Rubin, such that we not only think about uh, Rubin as a, uh, as a dark energy science collaboration type meeting, but also as something that will, uh, uh, will, will have much broader reach beyond uh, just an optical astronomy related to uh, cosmology. All right, um, so that's me. As far as agenda for today, that's a standard one uh, that we normally would have at the uh, um, at the assembly. A uh, few announcements uh, that I just basically completed. I'm assuming that all of you either uh, 
are already able to log in and if not you can take a, 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 a few steps here uh, and take uh, get yourself connected if you do not have an account and you have difficulty getting an account at least you can follow the links uh, for the tutorials that are listed in the uh, in this uh, in this particular uh, view graph here so let me maybe post both of those uh, in the chat window so in a case if you wanted to uh, um, if you wanted to uh, to 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 click on those if you don't have a a, a, a Ruben size platform uh, connection uh, you can certainly go to those and uh, and just at least follow uh, what I will be presenting today. Um, so after the uh, um, uh, before I even go into the presentation, I wanted to remind those of you who might or might not know uh, about the fact that uh, we are going to have a, a virtual summer school starting this coming Monday. Uh, you can still join in. Uh, the link is uh, at the uh, um, at the on the display here. So uh, um, we uh, are, are very much interested in having as many people as possible from the Ruben community uh, to observe, to watch, and this is going to be particularly useful for the novices, uh, people who have not really had a, any interaction or any experience with the Ruben Science platform, either via notebook or via the portal part. Um, it's basically aimed at the at the beginners. Uh, Portal 5 link did not work for you. Yeah, I got a 404 not found. The Ooh, four, okay. four one worked, but five didn't. I don't know why. I just thought I'd let you know. Okay. Did, did anybody okay. else have the same problem? Or was it just me? Yeah, I had the same problem too just now. So, uh, okay. So uh, I think what you need to do Hold on, thank you very much. Ah, okay, great. So uh, let me just uh, uh, update that link. Um, if 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 you actually, if for those of you who are connected, the, the fastest way to do this once you get to the portal four, if that so portal four works or portal five works, Tina. Four. Okay, so go to portal four, and then you can go one level up, and then you can click to portal five. They both should be available. I apologize yeah. for the for yeah. I'll I'll post a new link. I just I just got to it. So okay, great. See if uh, that works. Ah, I think it's a capital P. In the ah, oh, interesting. Thank you very yes. much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that needs to be fixed. Okay, okay. So first bug already discovered. All right. <laughs> So I'm going to go through those two presentations, and then uh, uh, at 10 o'clock, or maybe even before that, we're going to go for uh, breakout sessions. And again, we usually have a number of people who are interested in discussing something very specific, and there are some suggested uh, breakout sessions here on the right-hand side. So maybe if you want to raise hand and tell me that there is a specific breakout session you want to go to, fine. And if not, I'm going to be staying in the main session for the general question and answer. And in particular, what I want to do is uh, uh, to elaborate on the kind of stuff that I uh, maybe have not clearly presented to you in the uh, in main presentation. All right, let me stop here for a second and uh, uh, ask for, for questions if there's anybody who who needs to have something that, that needs to be expanded. All right, I don't see any raised questions, so let me stop sharing uh, this one. And let me share my uh, my uh, Ruben Science platform. So again, uh, share screen, and we're going to go into um, the Ruben Science platform. Okay, great. All right. So when you click on the Ruben Science platform, uh, you will normally come into the uh, UE user interface assisted part of the Ruben Science platform. So what you want to do is you want to go into the uh, um, part of the platform that says um, edit ADQL, because we're going to basically execute the ADQL query. So the goal of this, let me just uh, discuss a little bit more about what this is all about. This particular tutorial will demonstrate how to retrieve apparent magnitudes and cluster offsets, which meaning distance away from the center of a cluster for a sample of extended objects. We're going to be, of course, looking for galaxies around the rich galaxy cluster. And we're going to use one and two dimensional histograms to explore their apparent magnitude and color distributions. So we're going to use basically the, the, the goal of this tutorial is for you to be really familiar with use of uh, 
of uh, um, of histograms. And this basically assumes uh, this is this tutorial assumes that you're somewhat familiar at least with the uh, beginner level portal tutorial the, the like such as the one uh, that was zero one. And uh, again, we're going to use the ADQL, uh, Astronomical Data Query Language, which is similar to SQL, which is something that you may be familiar with. And again, um, the very first step that we're going to do is we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to go into this edit AUQL um, part of the uh, of the Rubin Science Platform entry, and you will actually come up with the uh, box, which will say ADQL uh, query. So let me clear it and I'm going to copy this. I'm going to clear it and re-enter it here. Okay, and you can see that this uh, execution of this box um, will uh, will uh, uh, will result in getting uh, some 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 interesting information. But just before I go to to that part, um, notice that this ADQL query uh, retrieves. Oh, uh, Tina, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to let everyone know that if you're in the Portal 4 tutorial, you can just copy and paste from the code line if you wanted to get that into the into your um, query box. That's right. You can actually pick it up from uh, HTML version of the portal tutorial and then copy it into the. Thank you very much for letting me know. That's, a, that's basically what I have done here. I copied it straight because I already had it on the. Th th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so just a few notes here. Notice that this query retrieves the G and R band calibrated fluxes uh, listed as calib capital flux columns from the object catalog. And those are apparent AB magnitudes. What, what it means is that they are well uh, well defined the relationship between magnitudes and fluxes. Okay, and uh, the, the conversion here is uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, in this ADQL statement, uh, SCI SQL Nanojansky to up magnitude, and then in parentheses, G color flux or R color flux. Again, this has to be this uh, AB magnitudes, um, and then renames those as G mag and R mag. Uh, so now, what well, this colored flux is, it's a flux within a 12 pixel aperture, and uh, um, it's appropriate for calculating fluxes for extended object colors, which is as it is in this tutorial. It would be actually different for point sources, but this tutorial specifically is going to be about galaxies. And this query also retrieves the G and R band extendedness parameters, and those are GX and RX. And X, again, we want to make sure that we're looking for extended sources, so we exclude stars or, um, or quasars from this particular uh, work. Uh, Andres, you have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, first, uh, could you make the font larger if you can? If not, it's okay. Uh, but the second question related to the query is, uh, do you need to specify extendedness equals one in all the bands that you're asking for? Or, or is it like a conservative choice? Or I guess my question is like, is it possible that an object is going to have one in one band and then zero in another one? Or if on... it's a very faint object, it might be the case. So this is just a conservative way. Thank you very much for the comment. It's a conservative way to, to do this. Uh, it's a little hard for me. I'm really reluctant to uh, to, to start messing around with the uh, uh, with the screen. So okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what I said. If you can, if not, uh, next time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I apologize for that. Uh, but the answer is that it's a conservative choice, then. It's better to right, do it that's in right. other events. Uh, Loredana, you have a question. Uh, yeah, a simple question. I would like to know uh, how we can uh, uh, read the the column uh, that the columns that are available from the catalog. Uh, you are using a specific uh, column uh, AB mag uh, and so nano Jansky blah blah. Uh, do we have the possibility to read all the available? Uh, columns from the DP0 catalog? That's an excellent question. You do. The number of columns is very large, so you have to be a bit careful trying to ask for all columns because then you will have to extract huge amount of data. There is information about that. If you go into the HTML version, there is some information about the uh, DP0.2 catalogs, tables, and columns, and this is in a data products definition document. 
I understand that this is sort of a fairly lengthy and fairly complex uh, document, uh, but you know, you can actually dig into this and at least try to figure out the obvious ones. There, there is a, a name of the column and also what the column really means in the particular thing. And uh, another place where you can uh, look at this is the DP 0.2 catalog schema browser. And again, both of those are in the header of the uh, uh, HTML rendition of the uh, of the tutorial. Did it help you? Did it answer your question, Loredana? Yes, yes, more or less. So I'm wondering if uh, clicking on DP0 DC catalog, it is possible also to see the list of the columns or not? Yes, the list of the columns is specific in the document that is listed that I mentioned earlier, which is just okay. above the step one of the of the tutorial. Perfect. Actually, Greg, I, I think Loredana just, just noticed something that I had never noticed before, which is see at the far left of your screen, um, where it says schema browser, if you click on that, I think it might show you, take you to the schema directly from there, which I wow. often know. So thanks, Lordana. That's, yeah, that's a very good point. I actually never really played around with that. I think idea. if you click on it, it'll just unfurl without taking you away from the page. So you could try it. Um, right. Uh, let me, yeah, it's, I, I'm reluctant to, 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 to click on this because I'm afraid, you know, that. Maybe clicking on the plus symbol, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't do anything weird, Greg. Okay. If you just, yeah. Okay. Click, I, yeah, click close. Yeah, it doesn't do anything weird. Okay, great. Thanks, Dina. Um, yeah, there, there is, uh, um, but anyway, the, the, so this this will give you all that information, what, what is available. It's a huge amount of information. So it's probably something will take you more than a uh, uh, than few minutes to, 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 to discover it. So um, the, uh, the so I mentioned about the fact that uh, this uh, query uh, picks up the calibrated flags within the 12 pixel aperture, and the query also retrieves the uh, extended parameters. That's which is what I said here, which is what uh, Andres pointed out that you know just to be conservative, we want to make sure that the objects are extended in both G band and R band. Now the important part here is that we a priori know that this is. Um, uh, the, the galaxy cluster is at this location of uh, right ascension and declination that is uh, listed here in the uh, uh, in the query that you can see it on the screen. We know that this is uh, something that we, uh, we 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 knew this a priori. So we're not looking for a cluster, we're picking up a, a known cluster and playing with the uh, with the content of the galaxies. In addition to that, we're also extending the uh, um, the, uh, the the distance from the center of the cluster for a given object, and that would be. Uh, via this radial offset, uh, uh, which is something that uh, is the, the, the line saying distance point, and, and it is going to be radial offset, which is the distance from this, of a given object from the center of galaxy. Now, we set here the, uh, num the total number of rows to 300,000. And the reason for that is that, you know, if we made a mistake, and for instance, we made our uh, uh, circle from which we're extracting the data too large and all of a sudden we have very large number of sources and that particular uh, uh, query would take very very long time so at this point i'm going to click on search and that will take maybe about on the order of one minute and you probably will see what i have on my screen that is being sent to background um, again i hope that this is not going to take forever i verified it both last night and earlier this morning it takes approximately one minute. So let's see if it's possible that with lots of people uh, participating, you will have a, um, uh, you will, okay, good, here it is. So um, it returned as I uh, expected on the order of a couple hundred thousand sources. There's 229, uh, 570 uh, objects. And the display that I see on my screen is uh, where we see the table of the objects and the uh, the display. It turns out that the Rubin Science Platform portal aspect will plot almost by default the only left-hand side and second to the left-hand side column. So if you want to plot something different, uh, you uh, for sure will want to have a, 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 a uh, you, you, you need to modify that particular plot. Now, this is uh, a, a plot called the uh, by view uh, with table, which is basically the image and uh, 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 the plot plus the plus the uh, uh, plus the table. But you can actually click on try view, which is what I'm going to click now. And what you will see on the left hand side, and unfortunately, you cannot see it very well because there's something wrong with my color scale. But uh, if you started from from scratch, you will see uh, basically an image uh, of the 
um, of the um, um, of of of, of uh, the area that you you requested. So on the right hand side, you have basically the location of objects, and it's essentially the the number of them. Uh, that that is uh, by the color darker means that there are more galaxies in that particular spot. Uh, so this is something that is basically a default. Uh, so now let me just in a table. Uh, let me just play around and, and add a constraint for the radial offset, and I'm going to make it uh, significantly smaller so that you can see uh, what, uh, and again, you put the number in, you click, uh, and uh, notice that the uh, on the right-hand side, the number of sources is much smaller. Now, instead of having this uh, this this map, essentially the, 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 the heat map on, or the number of sources in a location have individual sources plotted as points. All right, uh, so now uh, let me just go continue with this and we were going to create a color magnitude diagram for those sources. Notice that we have in our table on the bottom, let me go back to by view and to tables, which is basically, yeah. On the, um, uh, notice that, uh, uh, so we're planning to do the co color magnitude diagram here, okay? so. It's a widely used diagnostic plot where we're going to use uh, specifically G minus R colors uh, and uh, plot this against G band magnitude. By the way, uh, let me just return back to, uh, to, to the original version of this particular query where we asked for all the galaxies within one degree rather than the uh, restricting it to the uh, 0.03 degrees. Okay, so now what you might want to do is you might want to plot something different than RA versus DEC. So for instance, in our particular case, we will want to plot um, the color versus magnet. So let me go to the, uh, notice that there is like two little tiny gears. This is basically uh, something that allows you to set up chart options and tools for the particular chart. So let me click on that and you immediately will get a uh, display saying plot parameters. We're going to use more than what is on this particular uh, 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 on this particular uh, display here. So we're going to do something that's called overplot new trace because we'd like to do a little bit more of a, of a um, description. We, we basically want to do something that is not a histogram, but specifically heat map. Again, heat map is a two-dimensional histogram. So the color will be the number of, of sources in that particular band uh, or in that particular location, either in form of color or in form of a, X, Y, and so on and so forth. So for X, we're going to enter G magnitude here. And notice that if I type G, I immediately get all the uh, columns that are in my table that start with letter G. So I'm going to use G magnitude here. And in Y, I'm going to use the G magnitude minus R magnitude. So I can type G and I get G magnitude minus R and I get R magnitude. Very cool, okay. Uh, the number of bins, color scale, uh, we're going to use this as a, some kind of gray sequence or default, but for the time being, it's going to be just a gray sequence. Again, I'm following what's in the tutorial. And um, a number of X bins and Y bins, I will set as 200, again, because I already tested that this would be something good for the, for the display. For the trace options, you can actually give the name to this um, color magnitude diagram. I will call it as CMB. And for the chart options, I'll give it a, a title. Again, this is, uh, I'm doing all this to make it already look good, so. Okay, and X label will be, uh, th this will be for X label, I have a, uh, just G band magnitude. And for Y level would be G minus R color. Okay. Great. Okay. So for the time being, uh, I think I have everything entered. So when I click OK, magic happens and you get something that looks really strange. Well, it turns out that uh, this particular case. Uh, plotted this particular example, plotted all, all the data that we had in, in our uh, request. This is actually something that will get fixed. Uh, and we can actually, um, in this plot, you have both color magnitude diagram and RA versus DEC, and it's not very useful. 
But for the purposes uh, of, of uh, showing this, we are demonstrating the flexibility of the plotting capabilities. Okay, so how can we get just the color magnitude diagram here? That's sort of a little bit of a trick. Uh, and we have to you have to follow my steps pretty carefully. You have to remove the default trace zero, RE versus deck from the plot. And you can, again, you have to click double gears on it, okay? And once you click the double gears, okay, you in a pop-up view, you will go to modify trace. And now you go to choose trace. And uh, from drop drop down menu with a little arrow here, you click on trace zero, okay? And then on top of the screen, you have to click on remove active trace. Okay, so now I'm removing the first one, which is not the CMD, but the first trace zero, which is basically my, my display. And once you click that, that's being removed. Okay, very nice. So now we have uh, some kind of a color magnitude diagram here in, um, uh, with, the, with this grayscale. Okay, now um, this color palette is not all that beautiful. So let's convert this into something that looks a bit more attractive. Again, you can click on the uh, um, uh, on the uh, on the two gears, and now what you do is you you want to do the modified trace. And again, uh, I think that uh, you probably will have to re-enter everything here. But uh, um, so let me just do this. So this would be G magnitude, uh, and Y would be uh, G minus R. Okay, and uh, in under chart options, all I want to do is to just change the uh, um, the the color here. And uh, I think I do this by. Greg, can you invert the magnitude axis? I think I, you're right, and magnitude axis should be reverse, right? That's what you mean, right? No, th that's right. what. You yeah, that's right. Right. Okay. And I think I can apply this now. What I don't okay. So now now we have magnitudes going from uh, from faint to bright objects here. So uh, sure, uh, that is always a possibility. I'm trying to remember how do I change the uh, the color here, uh, the color palette. Go to default right there. Uh, sure, thank yep. you. That's right. Yep. So okay, that will look better. Great. Okay. All right, so now you have a, a nice plot. Again, I didn't put any axis, axis label, but you can certainly do this yourself. So, uh, um, so now you can interact with this plot any way you want. Okay, you can uh, select the magnifying glass and plus icon, and you can drag over the data to select a smaller area. So you can play basically with it in, in many different ways. So um, the, notice that there are some sharp cutoffs here, and especially the, the cutoffs in, uh, in, in, uh, um, in, in, in both magnitudes and colors. And this is entirely related to the fact that the simulation was uh, set up. Uh, this is, again, not real uh, data, but simulated data. So it was simulated only up to certain depths. So, uh, um, um, so, uh, so that's, that's what, uh, what this is all about. All right, uh, at this point, you can play around with this. You can do whatever you want. You can actually, the nice thing is you can actually click on the, at any point on the on the diagram and or actually move the cursor and it will tell you exactly what is the G magnitude and G and the, and the color and what is the, how many points there are. So notice that towards right hand side, it will be on the order of 10 points. But here when you have this very bright section, you have thousands of points. Again, we have 230,000 galaxies here very nice plot um so so great so um um the, you can use different uh, options for histogram plotting you can use for instance bayesian blocks um which is defined by the data itself and so on and so forth so you can actually uh, uh i i don't really want to go into those details because i only have a uh, half an hour left and i still have a, 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 a some more stuff that i wanted to show you so um the two-dimensional histogram, which is what's plotted here, is great. But you know, you can also do um, something that is single-dimensional histogram. Okay, so you can, for instance, uh, uh, set up the uh, uh, the uh, the histogram that will be only of one single color. So you can add additional plot. This is the step four, 
uh, you can add additional plot, which will be a histogram of apparent magnitude of the sources on the display here. Okay, so let me go to um, to the um, to the uh, double years again, and we're going to add new plot here. Okay, so we're going to add new chart, and it's new chart. We're going to plot it not as a heat map, but this time as a histogram. Okay, again, we want this is one dimensional histogram, and the color that uh, we want to the, the columnar expression that we want to put in here is just the G magnitude. We basically want to see how many objects are there in each. Uh, G magnitude uh, uh, bin. And again, we're not using the Bayesian blocks, but uniform binning. And so far, I'm uh, asking for 50 uh, bins here. And again, once I put the number 50, everything else got, uh, gets automatically populated from minimum to maximum uh, magnitude and so on and so forth. So again, I can add uh, for trace options, I can add color. And again, I'm not going to bother with this one for now. And for chart options, again, I can put all kinds of things like apparent magnitude distribution. Okay, and for X label, I can put apparent, apparent magnitude and for uh, Y label would be Okay, and again, I can do it in standard or reverse way, and let's not do log yet, so you will see how this looks like in linear uh, version, and notice that the third plot appeared magically on, a, on the right-hand side. So you can see that this really, you know, when I was playing with the, uh, with the portal, I realized that this is incredibly powerful set of tools. Again, the only disadvantage of using the uh, portal rather than using the uh, Jupyter Notebooks is the fact that you cannot execute any kind of uh, um, Python queries into this. So for that, uh, one one suggests uh, one would suggest that you should go to 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 the notebook aspect. Okay, um, so of course now I can click on the two gears again. I would like to, for instance, do a log log type display. My apparent magnet is log already. So now let me look for the Y to be uh, log and apply this and, and notice that uh, um, that the display changed a little bit. Now, uh, very quickly, I will tell you that you can actually overplot a uh, second color on the very same display here. And uh, uh, what, what I would need to do if I want to put a second color on, um, it's uh, again, um, let me just see what. Yeah, so here you can do overplot new trace, and instead of just a, a G, there will be R magnitude here, and we'll do the same thing and just click OK. And notice that there's two different traces here, so you can actually compare the R and G magnitude distributions on this plot. So I think this is very cool. Um, and if you go into the tutorial, uh, that is actually rendered via HTML. You can see how to change the colors and so on and so forth. I will not bother with that because that uh, is just purely a, 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 a cosmetic. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out here is that we selected one degree circle. That's an enormous number of galaxies, 200,000. It's un highly unlikely that those galaxies belong to just one cluster. You can actually restrict the objects in your display to only those who are that are within much smaller distance from the center of the cluster. You already know that it's a it's a cluster of galaxies, and presumably then you will see uh, some kind of other behavior of the color magnitude diagram. So let's let's do this. This is uh, I'm going through uh, step five point two, and in the radial offset, I'm going to put a uh, much smaller offset, sorry, 0 .0 0.0.05. Okay, this is all in degrees. Okay, and you will, and all I have to do is to enter uh, just to hit the carriage return here, and all of a sudden I will have a much, you know, not nearly as many objects in my diagram here. So this is very nice. Now you have a distribution of the uh, of the colors, um, sorry, of the uh, of the of the, uh, the flux or magnitudes in in both G band and and um, and R band on the right hand side, but notice that there is a very distinct, very clearly increased number of uh, of objects that are close to the uh, difference of G magnitude minus R magnitude of, of one, and uh, this is sort of uh, 
what you would expect for the uh, um, for the red, se red sequence in a cluster of galaxies. So this is pretty cool. Okay, at this point, uh, we are already 35 minutes into my presentation, so maybe I should stop and I will be very happy to go back and, uh, and uh, uh, review anything that we've done earlier. So please do raise your hand if there's something that's not clear or, um, or if you have any comments on the tutorial, uh, rendered version of the tutorial itself, please, please uh, let us know. Send me a, either send me a message or um, put it into the chat because I think we want to make sure that whatever we have in those tutorials will be useful, not only for you, for the uh, nice uh, 24 participants of this uh, discussion today, but also for many people who will be using those tutorials in the future, presumably with real data. Matthew, go ahead. Is there a parameter in the data that's used for star galaxy separation? Sorry, say it again. Is is there a, a quantity in the tables that's used for star galaxy separation? Uh, you mean this radial offset? This, this is an offset from the axis that we specified to the object, any object that meets the criteria that we requested. So let me maybe go into the um, the tab search and into the ADQL, uh, and it's this is the distance parameter here. Is you, the extendedness? The... Are you talking about extendedness? You're talking about the distance from the from the center of the cluster. I probably extendedness is is ah extendedness is just extendedness of individual uh, individual uh, object. The whole idea there is that we want to have sources that are not stars, but they're extended. They're presumably galaxy clusters. OK, so extended would be? Extendedness is just for individual object. The, uh, this, the radial offset is a distance of that object from the center of the cluster of galaxies. So those are okay. two different. Two so different. Ext extendedness of 0 would suggest it's a star? Yes. OK, thank you. Basically, extendedness of 1 is extended object. Again. Uh, I think uh, Loredana asked about that, and and, and again, I, a lot of the detailed information is in the uh, in the data products definition document, in uh, um, in the schema browser, and so on and so forth. So I, I would add that that um, right now the extendedness is just binary. It's it's one if the object is extended, classified as extended, and zero if it's point source. But um, but we'll probably have something more complex um, in you know later data releases, but for now it's just a binary one or zero choice. Andres, you have a question. Yeah, in other tutorials, it is binary, but in other tutorials, I think I've seen less than 0 0.5. So effectively it's binary, but I guess you're still allowed to put something in between zero and one for that parameter, correct? Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. And the other question that I had is, let's say we switch to point sources then you said you also need to change the flux right this calib flux you said it was more for extended sources so i guess you would need to choose like some psf model flux or something like that at the same time i that's think that's right and in fact i think we are going to uh to actually go to the psf model flux in the uh, uh in portal five when we talk about the the the, the flux of a supernova remnant All right, so if there's nothing else at this point, let me uh, just continue sharing this, but I'm going to now to uh, go for the uh, portal tutorial five and. Uh, and again, uh, those of you who joined late notice that there is my very minor bug, which is that portal five link has a capital letter, portal four link has a lowercase letter. We need to fix that because that's inconsistent. All right, so now I'm going to go through the um, uh, through the tutorial number five, which is the making multiband light curves with force photometry. Uh, so just a very um, brief, again, I'm, I'm going to stay on this page as far as my display is concerned. 
uh, but I'm going to just give you a bit of a rundown of what this uh, um, what this tutorial is. Uh, if you followed any other tutorials, the Portal Tutorial 2 had a supernova light curve, which was just plotted using the measurements in the uh, DIA source table. What well, DIA stands for is different difference image analysis. Uh, it's a table that contains only measurements when an object is detected uh, with a signal to noise ratio greater than five in difference images. What I mean by difference images, you probably know that Ruben uh, collects data over a period of time, and that is some kind of a baseline. And then there is a difference image is basically uh, subtracting the two images from each other and determining whether there is a significant increase of a, of a flux of a given source. So this is designed for looking for uh, for flaring sources such as supernovae or maybe some other flaring stars. Okay. Now, if your science goal requires lower signal to noise measurements, for instance, if you want to measure the fluxes of the object during all visits to the location, for instance, before and after a flare of, of an explosion, then you can use so called forced photometry. What's meant by forced photometry is basically it's a photometry at the location specified by you, even if the object is not detected there. Okay, so the there is a table of that kind. And what we're going to do in this particular case is we're going to go to study uh, 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 flags of the same supernova that we used in Portal Tutorial 2. And here we're just going to use just for the for the um, uh, for simplicity uh, an ID, uh, difference image analysis object ID, uh, which is this number one to five, blah, blah, blah. But I will come back to this in a second. So let me, uh, first of all, um, go to my uh to my to my tutorial four and uh here it is and i'm going to enter a different query here in a tutorial five so oh that's interesting okay that's better and we're going to portal five XT. Okay, great. So this is the one that you presumably have uh, on open on your uh, if you have the uh, uh, the HTML version, HTML version. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut and paste from HTML version, sorry, HTML version to my um, to my Ruben Science platform, and uh, we'll just continue with this. Uh, I'm going to clear this guy, and now I'm going to enter very different. Um, very different uh, um, query. So in this particular query, what I'm doing is I'm asking for the uh, object uh, that has this number, uh, object ID, this one to five, blah, 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 type thing. And I'm going to select for this particular object uh, information about when it was observed and also uh, its uh, uh, array index such that I can actually join two tables. One of them would be a, a table having to do with the uh, uh, with the visit. So uh, uh, again, um, the query retrieves the coordinates, DIA object identifier, the CCD visit identifier band, and force difference image flux, and it's error for all rows for this particular um, uh, the uh, DIA object of interest. But this note is that at the very end, I put an additional constraint, which is just the band I, okay? And uh, bear with me, this is going to be just a illustrating how to do it with one band and then we'll do a few other ones okay so let me just um just just there, there are a couple couple notes that i want to 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 make sure to to to, to convey to you this force source on uh, dia object table contains force photometry on both the difference images the psf diff flux and the processed visit image which is direct image flux is psf flux okay this tutorial uses a supernova. And for this particular case, we want to use the PSF diff flux. It's the first photometry on the difference image in which the static sky component, which basically presumably includes the flux of the host galaxy, has been subtracted. However, if you want to look for, a, for instance, a variable star behavior, this is not the right thing to do because you do not want to subtract some kind of average star uh, flux. In that case, you probably will want to use something that is called PSF flux. But in this particular case, we're just going to stick with the uh, PSF diff flux since we're really looking for the flux of an object that has um, 
been presumably some kind of steady flux and then exploded at some point. Um, now, one thing, there is a warning here, is the fact that you should not use the conversion of SCI SQL to Nanojansky or Nanojansky to absolute to AB magnitude flux because uh, that is quite a risky thing. That function does not return any value when you have a negative flux, which very often can happen when you subtract two images, right? You could easily have a negative flux in one of them. So the reason why this is uh, dangerous is because in some cases you might actually know that there was no non-detection, that the flux was zero rather than there was no observation, okay? So you have to be very careful, keep this in mind, okay? So I just wanted to, uh, to just mention this. Okay, but at this point, uh, we're going to just click search and uh, and again, this was sent to the background. And what you will see is the same thing as before, this whole thing of uh, uh, the plot being only uh, the rightmost two columns. So again, in order to plot the flux as a function of time, you have to click the two gears. And for uh, x-axis here, this is again, we're going to do modified trace because we're modifying this particular axis instead of coordinate here. Of course, we want to have on x-axis, you want to have time. So we're gonna do, um, MJD, but of course, in order to have it look nice, we have to subtract sixty thousand because you don't want to have some kind of very large number on the on the x-axis. We're not going to put any error for the time being, and why we're going to do this, as I said, PSF um, the flux, okay? And uh, uh, in trace options, in order to make it nice, uh, actually, we're probably not going to do anything in trace option, but in chart option, we'll put the um, title here. Okay. Again, this is exactly what I have in, a, in, the, in the tutorial. And uh, for uh, X label, I will have time. Okay, for Y label, label, I will have a PSF. Flux in Nanojansky. And I'm going to actually put a grid in here such that you will see clearly that the difference flux can go below zero. So let me apply this. Aha, great. Okay, so now we have a flux of the supernova in the, uh, um, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the I band, and again, notice as I mentioned earlier that this flux does go below zero. It simply has to do with the fact that uh, it's just a standard uh, sort of uh, 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 related to the uh, uh, that 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 part is related to the uh, to the fact that this is a subtracting subtracting of images. Okay, now we can restrict the um, x axis, the MJD range. Okay, and again, using the same kind of uh, years and and uh, for chart options now you can do um, x meant to be 930 this is basically what you if you have played uh, with the uh, uh, with portal tutorial uh, that has this flexible supernova you can apply this and now this is just uh, just the behavior of the flux of the supernova looks pretty cool okay so this is all great but now we are only plotting the i band so what uh, how how would we go for plotting uh, a multiband light curve? Okay, so the portal tutorial, uh, sorry, the portal does not have the functionality yet to plot a multiband light curve. Uh, and uh, in other words, we cannot quite put uh, different color markers for different bands and uh, add a legend. Uh, that will be done in the future. We already are planning to do this, but there is a workaround for this. And it's sort of a cute one. And uh, you will see it in a second that we're going to do something uh, sort of very non-standard here. Um, we uh, will plot this uh, to, um, to uh, we will make sure that, 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 that we can plot it in different colors. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the, uh, uh, into tab search and I'm going to go into my edit AQL. And at this point, I will remove the restriction that the F, the, 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 the observing band is just an I band, okay? So now let me just issue this, and this presumably will create a light curve, which will have all bands that will be present on the display here. Again, I will have to 
uh, do my usual change of the uh, of the trace for x we want to have exposure minus 60,000 and uh, y band not coordinate deck but we really want to have um, the, the the usual um, uh, flux which is uh, PSF the flux okay and I'm going to apply this I'm not going to bother with uh, putting the proper labels but notice that there are many different data points here okay and that has to do with the fact that uh, we have now not, have not restricted it just to the I band, but we uh, have all of them. And you can see this in this column on the right hand side, and uh, one, two, three, four, fifth column says the band is in, in, in different labels. Now, the nice thing is that you can actually click on a data point here. And if you do that, automatically you will see uh, a, a different line in the table that is telling you which is the data point. So this is just, I'm, I'm highlighting, illustrating this because this is a really nice aspect of the of the portal that, you know, it's extremely flexible. So uh, I would highly recommend for all of you to play around with the with this and, you know, at your own spare time or maybe during the second hour. And you can certainly ask me about some of the additional aspects of functionality. But anyway, so let's move on and figure out how to, um, um, how to do this workaround to make the, uh, um, conversion of, uh, of of plots uh, in different bands to be in proper colors, okay? So now we have the uh, plot uh, that is, uh, uh, not, so let me let me just get going on the workaround. Uh, the way to do this is you can convert the values in the column that is called the band into its ASCII value, okay? And you do this by the following trick. You can see that there is this little, uh, I think it's a, 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 a one, two, three, it's two, a, a, two to the left from two gears on a table. There is something that says add the column. I hopefully you can see this. We're going to do this. And now we're going to add one more column to our display, which will have actually a, a, some kind of a, um, some kind of a, 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 an expression. So we're going to enter an expression that will be called bands ASCII. Okay, and this particular expression, this is a very clever workaround that came from some of our Italian collaborators who actually must have encountered the same kind of thing in the past. And here, I'm going to ask for the ASCII value of what is in the column that is known as band. And again, this is the syntax. So bands, of course, band, not bands, but band. And the syntax here is ASCII, open parenthesis, double quote, band, double quote, close parenthesis. An important trick is that you have to make sure that the data type is long. So this is just like an a, a, a integer rather than, a, than some kind of a, a, a more complicated one. So I'm going to click on add column. Okay. And voila, notice that this new column appeared. This is called band ASCII. Now, am I, why am I doing this? The reason for that is that I'm going to use associate, I will associate the band's ASCII with some color, okay? So I'm going to go back to my, uh, to my two gears, and I'm going to set the plot parameters in a, in a very specific way. Again, the plot parameters here are still the same exposure midpoint, the PSF uh, diff flux, and so on and so forth. But now for trace options, I'm going to use the following trick in the uh, in a, in a color map. I'm going to say here I'm going to say bands ASCII and the color scale. I'm going to use something that uh, will be will provide me with some kind of colors. Okay, and. Um, Again, for um, I'm not going to bother with putting the chart title and labels and so on and so forth. But uh, what I'm going to do here in chart options, I'm just going to uh, add a grid. And this is now going to be pulling a rabbit out of the hat. Take a look on this. Isn't this cool? <laughs> so now, of course, I cannot. Um, I cannot uh, uh, basically change the specific colors to be exactly what I want to have and, and have some kind of a 
a table on a, on a right hand side. But you know, I, I found this kind of workaround to be really sort of a bit of magic. I, you know, this is pretty exciting. So, uh, so you can of course now restrict the uh, um, multiband light curve to maybe single or multiple filters. And the way you would do this is again in the band. For instance, if I want to have just the red filter, let me do this equal single quote R single quote. Okay, carriage return. And notice what happened. Okay, I just got only one filter. But what I can do here is I can do two filters and this, they would be in different colors. So for instance, you could do equals R or I. Okay, so I entered the, and now you have only two filters in two different colors. Very cool. This is really nice. So um, um, you're not choose your own symbols or colors for the data points. It's a temporary drawback of the portal, but you know at least you can you can you can do something with this. So you know this is this is uh, uh, you know again again something you can play with. So I I I, I personally really like this. You can you can play around to you uh, add error bars to the light curve, and you can try another supernova. Again, this is in a um, in the tutorial, so you can you can play with this. All right, at this point we're at nine fifty eight and. Totally surprised that I managed to be exactly at one hour. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions. And then uh, thank you very much, Bob, for the applause. And uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, break into breakout room. So at this point, I'm going to stop uh, uh, sharing. I think we're done with the uh, with the tutorials. But actually, maybe I, let, let me keep it on. And if anybody has any any questions or, or needs any elaboration on this one or the other one, just raise your hand. And if not, we're going to let those of you who want to go into breakout rooms to go off to breakout rooms, and I will stay here to, to continue answering questions. All right, I don't see any hands that are raised, so uh, um, great. All right, and uh, I. Are there any people who are interested in in uh, in discussions in uh, breakout rooms? I can set up. Uh... Oh, great! Thank you, Tom, for uh, for for your comments and and Bob. I think that this is. I, I, I honestly think that the portal is really for people who are sort of getting started. But then again, once you start playing around with it, you realize how many incredibly useful uh, uh, features the the. Um, the portal has, uh, as you probably know, this was not developed specifically just for Ruben. This this tool, this this portal that you see here, has been developed a long time ago by uh, IPAC, I think, for other missions. So this is sort of a, a, a an a, a evolution of, of this. So great. All right. Okay, Lauren Dana, thank you very much for joining again. I know for you it's Friday late in the afternoon. Thank you very much for coming in, and we hope that uh, all of you uh, will be able to um to join in for the virtual summer school starting on monday again you have the link for that in the uh, uh in, uh, in 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 email or in a message that uh, that uh, uh jeff sent to you so uh, uh i will be also we'll be doing some more presentations on the portal functionality in the virtual summer school i think uh um gloria and myself will be will be covering several different tutorials so uh so if you if you're more interested in if you're interested in in portal tutorials we'll have more of those all right so let me stop here and uh, i will stop recording as well so uh